Welcome back to Springhouse Farms and the uh, series of videos that we're making with Sustainability Matters. Um, in this series, we're hoping to give you a little introduction to some of the flowers and the plants that you'd be working with mm -hmm. and uh, give you an insight into the challenges you might face and some of the rewards. Well, and this is a reward day and mm -hmm. it is a beautiful day today with beautiful blooms. So, what do you think? <laughs> it's a beautiful morning in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, what's happening now is it's we're really at our kind of our peak, full fresh bloom, and kind of the, our our main flowers are really kind of peaking right now. Oh yeah, and yeah, it's, it's just it's beautiful, and it's probably this type of a bloom here will last several weeks. We're hoping for a little bit of rain that would make it last a little bit longer. Yeah. but you know it, it's it's gorgeous right now. Um, the field we're standing in, it's kind of the field that runs down right from our house to the to Alonzoville Road. And this one, this is 27 acres, and we planted this um, about 18 years ago in 2002. What was that? It's your phone. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> the field we're standing in right now is about 27 acres, and we planted this 18 years ago in 2002. And we planted a pretty big diversity of flowers and grasses. Um, you know, in a, in a native prairie, that's what you want, is you're looking for the diversity. Uh, and so, um, 11 grasses, did I say that already? Yeah. Oh, yeah 11, and about 60 flowers. And some of those flowers are, uh, we have had a few annuals, but most of them are perennials. Right, and right. some are short lives, some are long lives. Right, so uh, one thing we've really noticed about the prairie over the years is it's a little bit different every year. And there's something stronger and something a little bit weaker each year. What we've planted is remarkably resilient. and But there is a lot of, of maintenance that has to go with it. And Jeff does most of that. But any, and I just enjoy it. But anyway, you have to watch out for turf grasses like fescue because that will um, inhibit some of the growth of some of the flowers. And then mm -hmm. you also have to watch out for trees that want to start growing. At what, and some of the trees are the like the autumn olive and so forth. Yeah, that, the pesky trees, locust, right, autumn olive. Right, and they get going. And then all of a sudden you've got kind of a woodland type of a situation. Yeah, so, so those are the two threats. The grasses like uh, fescue, right. turf grasses, those will choke a field out or the woods, mm -hmm. um, of course, those will choke these fields out. But otherwise, these things hold their own against everything. If you have yeah. concern about thistle, don't worry about thistle, it'll just be gone. Yeah. Uh, for example. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. let one, but there are mistakes you can make, and we'll talk about some of those things in the management section of this series. But, um, but overall, uh, nature is on your side, and these mm -hmm. flowers want to survive, they want to thrive. And as you can see, they're doing a good job it's of it. It's just glorious right yeah. now. So uh, you never get tired of looking at no, it. No, not at all. <laughs> it's really neat. The dominant species right now is a flower called gray head cone flower. Um, another term for it is yellow cone flower, and uh, the scientific name is Retibita pinnata. Um, it really is prolific. Uh, you can see how dominant it is. Uh, in the midsummer, um, and as we said earlier, it's uh, July 5th right now. Um, the uh, flower itself has these ray florets, and you can see those yellow ray florets, but the actual blossoms technically are those little tiny things in the head. And uh, those will mature into a, a lot of seeds here, and so in the fall, this dries out and there are all these seed heads. And on a good year, we'll actually bring a combine in here, set the combine cutting head high and harvest that seed and sell that seed to a, uh, a wholesaler that uses it for uh, prairie restorations, roadside restorations in the Midwest, for example. And, um, and then in the winter, uh, especially if we haven't harvested the seed, this is a giant bird feeder. And they're just all these birds throughout the winter that uh, love to eat the seed. And uh, that, so that's a really fun flower that uh, you'll get a lot of if you uh, plant this seed. Um, Allie, uh, come here. Uh, Ooh. Let's hear, look what we found. This, really is, neat. this is called Rattlesnake Master. 
and uh, you can see the leaves at the bottom are very unusual and they have these little spines on them. Um, and then the, uh, the flower. It's a sturdy little thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it has a white blossom, um, but later on it does some interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, it rattles as it dries out, and I assume that's where they got the name from. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's really, it's really unusual. It's nice. So rattlesnake. Is this common, or? Uh, I don't know. I, it's, it just, it, it's not dominant by any means. It's just sporadic, and it kind of stays in its place too, which is nice. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it is nice. Rattlesnake master. This is wild white indigo. Um, earlier in the season, we had wild blue indigo blooming, and it was, it's a more of a, a bushy plant and uh, lots more flowers on it. But the wild white indigo is kind of fun. It, it's sporadic through the prairie. It's some nice height. It comes up above. Um, it's just kind of whimsical looking. So it's a, it's a, a kind of a nice complement to the gray-headed coneflower when it's, while it's blooming right now. This uh, stalk that I'm standing next to actually has a blossom way up there. This it's is the- Seven feet, it looks yeah. like. This is the uh, compass plant. And supposedly, um, with these leaves, this is the one where the leaves supposedly point north, south, east, west. <laughs> I don't necessarily believe that. Um, or, and if they do, well, I guess they are right now to some degree. But it's not that helpful because there's not a sign There's no on indication it, on it. <laughs> not which leaf points which direction. <laughs> right. But anyway, that's a compass plant. And this is actually a short one, believe it or not. They get um, 10, oh, 11 yeah. feet tall. Yeah. Very dramatic. Uh, this plant is called uh, butterfly milkweed or butterfly weed. And the scientific name is a fun one to say. It's Asclepius tuberosa. I love the orange color, as you can see. I've yeah, got my nice orange job shirt matching right. your outfit to yeah. the to the plant. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know it is a milkweed, as the name says, and it uh, is a favorite of butterflies. That's the name also implies. Um, and I used to think that it was the number one host for uh, monarch butterflies, but it turns out that it isn't. Um, the reason being that this plant is low in cardenolide, and cardenolide is the uh, chemical that monarchs want to consume from other milkweed species because that gives them protection against bird consumption. In other words, the birds eating them. Um, the, uh, that cardenolide apparently tastes bad, and that's why uh, monarchs are, uh, use this as a defensive mechanism so they aren't eaten by birds. Mm. Um, this one, uh, another interesting thing about this flower is that it's only pollinated by a particular species of wasp. The reason being that it has a complex uh, uh, flower with where the neck, the uh, pollen is very deep, and only that wasp has the correct shape proboscis to get down in there and, and pollinate. So that's the uh, butterfly milkweed. And it looks like there's a there's one right next door to it that's bitten oh, off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look at uh, in here too. Um, Deer also love the blossoms, uh -huh. so they go around and chew off the blossoms of these. Yeah. Uh, so you think they'd be full by now with everything else they've eaten? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> this is a Shasta daisy, and it is not a native. But if you remember, probably in elementary school, um, hearing about somebody called a horticulturist named Luther Burbank. And he originated this as a hybrid from a number of different daisies and from three continents. And I, I, beautiful little flower. Um, it was named after Mount Shasta because of its white color, like the snow cap on the top of the mountain. Um, it's, it's truly one of my favorites. And I think it's because that when it's blooming in the fields, it kind of makes the other colors sing. And so now with all the yellows and pinks and oranges, the beautiful white just, just kind of, kind of sets everything off. So anyway, one of my favorites. Here we have common milkweed, and this is a favorite of monarch butterflies, as you can see, feasting on it right this minute. Um, if you have common milkweed in your fields naturally, go with it, because it's a great plant. This is a black-eyed Susan, probably a flower that most of us are familiar with. And as we talk through things today, I think that you've seen that we've got, you know, lots of diversity in the flowers and so forth. And, and uh, Jeff has, planted a lot of trees this during this yeah, pandemic. Yeah, 60 so yeah, far. Yeah, it's his coping mechanism. And, 
and uh, behind me as well, you can see a bluebird house. And we have, uh, I think, 30, 30 some bluebird houses. And so we've really tried to promote the habitat and lots of birds, lots of insects. And I think we've been pretty good with that. This is the uh, purple comb flower. And its uh, scientific name is Echinacea purpurea, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's in the sunflower family. And here you see uh, two components to this this inflorescence here. One is the uh, lingulate florets. They look like tongues. They sort of hang down. Yeah, yeah. And then the capitulum is the uh, top part. This is the pale purple cone flower. And as you can see, it's just a little bit past right now. And as we talked about the per regular purple cone flower just a little bit ago, uh, these are lingulate florets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Get that right, exactly. okay. Um, and it's the same situation here with the um, this part, right, Jeff? Is, that, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it, it's, it comes up fairly early in the prairie. So before a lot of the other color comes up, this, this is the one you see that comes up and you think, oh my gosh, it's, it's all starting. So it's kind of fun to see. This is called upright comb flower. And it has these uh, really tall central part of the flower. And it has the uh, lingulate florets like other comb flowers do. And look over here. This is uh, Mexican hat. Um, and I guess it looks like a little sombrero. That's why they call it Mexican hat. This beautiful flower is called Royal Catchfly. Uh, scientific name is Celine Regia. And uh, the reason it's called catchfly is the stem secretes a sticky substance that actually uh, can catch flies and other insects. And uh, I can feel it on my fingers right now. Um, it actually kills the insects, but it's not uh, for the purpose of digestion by the plant, but rather for protection. This is bee balm, also called horse mint. And here, if you look closely, there's a little bumblebee, just like what stung Allie on one of our previous episodes in the yes, lab. Yes, and I have made a full recovery. <laughs> um, the, uh, an another name for it is bergamot, and the uh, scientific name is uh, uh, monarda, and uh, monarda means moth. It's a native to North America, and it's in the mint family, and you can tell because it has the square stems, uh, and very stiff square stems. Um, and you'll also hear about monarda because it has all sorts of uh, therapy potentials. Uh, for example, the Native Americans used it for everything from stomach and bronchial ail ailments to um, dental and gum disease. And it can even uh, treat headaches or fever. And uh, supposedly uh, by uh, eating it, you can reduce uh, excessive flatulence. <laughs> Good thing to have. <laughs> <laughs> this is Leatris. And it is at the very, very start of its bloom. It'll be a, a beautiful lavender spire of color. And it's also referred to as gay feather and um, blazing star. And if you notice in the background, we just noticed that uh, on a couple of our dead ash trees from the emerald ash borer, there's some vultures hanging out. I guess we've been out too long. So it's evening here at Springhouse Farms. and. We have learned that it's very important to remember that after you've worked really hard on your fields and you have your beautiful prairie restoration, sometimes you have to just sit down and enjoy out and get get in the plants and in the color and get yourself a little glass of wine or a beverage and just enjoy the afternoon. We've got a little Portuguese wine here. Jeff, do you wanna yeah. do you wanna open that wine? Yeah. Um, oh, I'll open it. <laughs> One hand's busy, you have to open it. I'll open the wine. <laughs> I could open it with my teeth. Oh, that would be good. Okay, so anyway, let me pour you a little bit of wine. Oh, that looks really, really good. I think that's enough for you, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Look at my glass. I didn't bring it to the table. Hey. So, it <laughs> just... You just want to remember, you're going to work really hard on the fields and you're going to have ups and downs, 
but at the end of the day there's always a nice glass of wine. <laughs> One thing to be aware of with habitat restoration is there might be a lot of noise to wake you up at 5.30 in the morning.